right, well, go ahead and take your Bibles and turn to the book of Luke. I'm going to look at a familiar passage this morning, familiar to some of us. Luke chapter 19. Chapter 19, the story of Zacchaeus. The story of Zacchaeus. Wonderful passage from the Word of God. In this passage, Zacchaeus meets Jesus and ends up getting saved in this passage. We want to look at it. We'll read it here. I'll tell you the title. And we'll pray and ask the Lord for His help this morning. So good to be here with you this morning. As the uh, pastor already mentioned, I'm from South Carolina and uh, in evangelism. So we travel around and get to be in a lot of different churches. And it's just, a, it's just a wonderful thing. You know, you come into a church, and this is the second time I've been here. So it's kind of nice. I knew some people before, uh, before I came. But, you know, you come in and, and you meet people that you've never met before. And in just a matter of a day or two, it's like you've known them for forever. You know? Uh, Andrew, for example, he wasn't here last time, and uh, showed up, got to meet him on Friday, and uh, we met, and you know what, I feel like we're friends now, and uh, it's just really, really neat how that is, and I get to have that privilege almost every week, and it's just fantastic. Um, I love the way the church works, you know, and uh, we have that common bond, uh, we know Jesus Christ is our Savior, and it's, it's just so exciting to be here with you. I love your pastor, and uh, appreciate his heart, vision, love for the community here. And uh, I'm telling you, I'm just thrilled. I, if I lived in Fort Lauderdale, I would come to this church. I like what you guys are doing here. I, I, I got home last, last year. My wife wasn't able to come with me. She's here today. This is Emily. My wife's sitting here on the, on the third row right behind the boys here. And um, I got home last year, and I said, Emily, I said, this, this has just been the greatest week, you know? And just began to tell her about everything that had happened last week and about the people that I had met and uh, how they loved uh, the teenagers in their community and uh, how they were really burdened about them and uh, just loved uh, ministering and pouring uh, their lives into those people uh, in their community and showing them the love of the Lord. And it was just a blessing to be able to relay to her uh, about the church that I had come to visit down in Fort Lauderdale. So this year I brought her with me. And uh, it's been it's even better uh, this year. Uh, maybe next year I'll be able to bring my kids with me. Talked to them on the phone just a little bit this morning before church. They were they were in Gatlinburg and Pigeon Forge. It's already been mentioned with their grandparents. They they went to Dollywood. You might know what Dollywood is. They went to Dollywood yesterday and uh, had a lot of fun. And and they got their grandmother to get on the roller coasters with them. And I think they just had a really good time. And they uh, talked to us this morning. They're going to church there uh, this morning and uh, talked to them. And they. Okay, in our conversation, I don't, remember, I don't remember exactly how it went, but it was really funny. They said, we just wanted to call, um, or when we were talking, and our kids told us that we just wanted you to know this morning that we love you. you or, or I said, I just want you to know this morning that we love you. And I think one of them asked me if, we were, if, we, if I loved them, if I was going to love them this afternoon too. You know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, because I said, this morning, this is awesome. My kids are 10 and 12, uh, two girls, and uh, maybe sometime we'll be able to bring them down and let you introduce to them as well. But uh, we're just thrilled uh, to be here with you today. So let's look at the Bible, Luke chapter 19 and verse number 1. The Bible says, And Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was the chief among the publicans, and he was rich. And he sought to see Jesus who he was, and could not for the press, because he was little of stature. And he ran before, and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up, and saw him, and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. And he made haste, and came down, and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all murmured, saying that he was gone to be guest with a man that is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house, for so much as he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to be in your house today. And Father, we just ask that you would bless this time. Father, I ask for your help, that you would help me to preach this word uh, accurately, Lord. And uh, Father, that you would be with each and every person here, that you would give them ears to hear, Lord, that they would be able to apply this to their life. Uh, Father, I pray that this would be one of those mornings that would make a difference. And uh, Father, that nobody would leave here the same because of the things that we've heard and trusted in this morning. Father, we love you, and in Jesus' name I pray, amen. 
No, the, the Bible, you can keep your hand here in the book of Luke, but the Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 28 and verse number 19, you probably know the verse, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. If you're saved here this morning, if you've trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, God's given you many commands. But one of the commands that God has given you is that you need to go. Is that you need to go and that you need to be a witness for Him. In this passage, in Luke chapter 19, the passage we just read, we find here, I believe, the master soul winner at work. We find here Jesus, the Son of God, walking about, and in this passage He meets a sinner. He meets a sinner who needs to be forgiven. And in this passage, what Jesus does is he finds a way to, re to relate to him, and he engages him, and he ends up at the end. Zacchaeus gets saved. Right? And um, if you're a Christian here, would you like to be a better soul winner? Yes. Mm -hmm. I would like to be a better soul winner. I've never met a Christian that wouldn't like to be a better soul winner <clears throat> than they are. To be able to share their faith that they have in Jesus with somebody else. Right? You young guys that uh, you trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're going back to school next week, aren't you? There's such a need for young men who have trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior to go to school and to take a stand for Christ and to be a witness. To be a witness for Jesus Christ. How do you do that? What does it look like? And uh, in this passage, um, I'm only going to have two points this morning. I, I, know, I know probably good sermons have three points, Pastor Christ. But I'm only going to have two this morning, okay? Uh, we're going to talk about the sinner, and that's represented by Zacchaeus. And we're going to talk about the soul winner, and that's represented by Jesus, okay? Now, um, we'll spend the first few minutes here, first uh, 10 or 15 minutes looking at the sinner, and then we'll spend the second 10 or 15 minutes looking at the soul winner. But my proposition to you is this. If we will just do what Jesus did in this passage in Luke chapter 19, then we can see the same results that Jesus had. What I'm going to share with you this morning about being a soul winner is not some 28-step plan, you know, that you have to have and you have to do this and that and the other and hold your mouth just right, eat a certain thing for breakfast and all that, you know, this complicated plan. It's not complicated. It's just straightforward, just right down to earth. If we'll just do what Jesus did, we can have the same results that Jesus had. Okay? So let's take a look at it this morning. Let's look first here at Zacchaeus, uh, the sinner. The Bible says there in verse 2, and Behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was the chief among the publicans, and he was rich. You know, I, I, I wish that sinners who, um, who wanted me to talk to them about Jesus would wear a t-shirt that said, uh, hey, you know, uh, I'm not saved, but I'm curious about Jesus, and, and would you come talk to me, right? And uh, maybe they could make it uh, a bright neon green t-shirt, okay? And they could sell them at Walmart, Right? So then, if somebody was curious about Jesus, they could go to Walmart, they could buy one of these t-shirts, and they could just wear it. And then we as Christians, we'd just be looking for them, right? And then whenever we'd see them, we'd say, oh, that's the person that I need to talk to. And then you'd just go over and you'd say, hey, I know Jesus. Let me take the Bible and, and introduce you to him. Wouldn't, wouldn't that be fantastic? You know, I think that'd be fantastic. I think we ought to start selling those t-shirts, Pastor Bryce. But you know what? I have looked for those t-shirts. And I have never I've never seen one. You're not going to see them when you go to school next week. They're, they're not, they're not going to have them on. They're not going to be saying, please come talk to me about Jesus, right? And uh, we, I, wish, I wish that was the case, but uh, it's just not. And you know, the truth be told, if they were going to go buy themselves a t-shirt, it probably wouldn't say, please come talk to me about Jesus. I'm curious. It'd probably say something like, please leave me alone. I'm not interested. Okay? Right? And that's more, more or less what we see when we go about Right? You know, Zacchaeus, I want to just look at his life here. Now, Zacchaeus wasn't wearing a t-shirt, but if he was wearing a t-shirt, he'd say, leave me alone. He'd say, leave me alone. All right? Let's look. What was Zacchaeus' profession? It says, and behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was the chief among the what? Publicans. The publicans. A publican was a tax collector. Okay? Now, Zacchaeus was a Jew. We learn that later down in, in the passage. Uh, I think down there in verse number 9, it says he's the son of Abraham. So he's a, he's a Jew. Okay, but at this time, the Jewish people were being pressed, oppressed by the Roman government. And the Roman government was collecting taxes from them. 
Now, I'm not just thrilled to pay taxes to the American government, to be honest with you. I think they misspend and misappropriate, and so on and so forth. But this is not about politics, so I'm not going to go that direction, all right? I was just recently down in Trinidad, and uh, the pastor down there said, you know what, I don't like politics. He said, poly means many, and tick means blood-sucking critter, right? <laughs> many blood-sucking critters, you know? I thought, that's pretty good, you know, politics. But you know what? You know, we pay taxes here. You know, taxes, really, they aren't that exorbitant or anything. Right? And we pay taxes, and, and there's a lot of benefit for paying taxes in the United States of America. I mean, we've got great infrastructure. Here in Florida, I started my career back, I went to North Carolina State University, got a career in engineering, and I started my career right down here on Commercial Boulevard, 3400 West Commercial Boulevard, working for the Florida Department of Transportation as a structural engineer. And I'm telling you, Florida spends a lot of tax money on infrastructure, and you have nice roads here. Your roads are much nicer than our roads in Florida. Your bridges are nicer than our bridges uh, in South Carolina, all right? And uh, you know what? We get, we get something in return for the taxes that we pay. At this point in time, if you were a Jewish person, you would have really hated to pay taxes. You were paying taxes to an oppressive government that was keeping you poor, that was keeping you down, and that was had, it was nothing good. It, was, it wasn't good. And it wasn't just a little bit of taxes that you were paying. It was an exorbitant amount of taxes. Most people couldn't even afford to pay their own taxes. And Zacchaeus was a Jewish man who had basically, in the eyes of Jewish people, sold his soul to the Roman government and become a tax collector. And he was collecting taxes from his own people to turn around and give to the government of Rome an oppressive government who was oppressing the Jewish people of this time. Uh, it was not a good situation. Publicans have a very uh, bad reputation in Scripture. Even Jesus didn't really speak kindly about publicans, all right? Uh, if you have your Bibles and you want to turn with me, you certainly can. In Matthew chapter 5, uh, the Bible there, Jesus is speaking. And in verse 46, he says, For if ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same? In other words, if you love people that love you, I mean, you're, you're no different than a publican. I mean, even, even, do you, do you see that sarcasm there? Even a publican can love somebody who loves him, right? Jesus is talking about the tax collectors. They were just, that people just hated them. People didn't really want anything to do with them. In Matthew chapter 21, verses 31 and 32, the Bible says this as he's concluding the story there. He says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, that the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you, speaking to the Pharisees here. You know, look at the company that even Jesus put the publicans with, right? The publicans and the harlots, right? The outcasts of society. You know, I would venture to say this. If you were a Jewish person living in the day of Christ and Zacchaeus walked down the street, you wouldn't have wanted anything to do with him. You wouldn't have wanted anything to do with him. He was a publican. You would have hated everything about his life. You'd have hated his job. You'd have hated what it stood for. And you'd have thought that he had sold you out to the Roman government. In Matthew chapter 18, we find uh, the section there on church discipline. So we find there in verse number 15, if your brother uh, shall trespass against you, you need to go and tell it between him and uh, you, thee alone. And then if he won't hear thee, verse number 16, take two more with you. And then 17, if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as an heathen man and a publican. In other words, at the end of the whole church discipline process, at the end of it, if the person won't respond to any of the confrontations to get it right, and he won't even get right after he's been brought in front of the church, then treat him like a publican. Publicans weren't viewed as somebody that you'd want to have over to your house for dinner. He was an outcast of society. But not only was he a publican, but he was the chief publican. You know, one of the other things we learn about as we study this time in history is that publicans were not honest people. Uh, they would go, uh, let's say, uh, let me just pick somebody here, uh, Jose, all right? Uh, Jose, let's say that you were a little bit older, maybe 20 or so, and uh, you got a job, and uh, you owe some taxes, right? And I'm just going to make up a number, but let's say uh, that at the end of the year, you owed uh, the government $500. Right? For your taxes, you had to pay them $500. Right? Maybe you had made several, several thousand dollars this year. And uh, if it was at this time, uh, Zacchaeus would come to where you lived. And he would come to collect taxes from you. And he'd look on his ledger and he'd see from the Roman government that, Jose, you owed the government $500. And he'd look at you and he'd say, Jose, you owe me $525. Now you wouldn't have any recourse of action against him. So what do you have to do? You have to pay him $525, right? So he'd take the $500 and he'd give that to the Roman government. 
The other 25, he'd just take and he'd do what with it? He'd just stick that right down his pocket. Okay? $525, he'd just keep it, right? He was in charge. He was the chief among the publicans. So not only was he corrupt, but he was in charge of the corruption that was taking place. So here's a man who was a Jew who sold his soul to the Roman government to collect taxes, and then on top of that, he'd extort more money than you owed so that he could keep it and then use it. You know, what we know about the average Jew at this point in time is that it was rough. They just basically tried to survive from day to day. They didn't have nice houses. They were just trying to exist. But what does the Bible say about Zacchaeus at the end of verse number 2? He was the chief among the publicans and what? He was what? He was rich. All that extra money that he took from you that you didn't have to give in the first place that he stuck in his pocket, he went back and he lived a lavish lifestyle just flaunting his luxury in the face of all the oppression and the poor and destitutedness of the average Jewish person at this point in time. You know, most people uh, that were Jewish, they didn't want anything to do with somebody like Zacchaeus. He was rich. He was a chief publican. But I want you to see something about Zacchaeus. You know, we are guilty, aren't we, as Christians, of judging books by their covers? Right? Uh, when we see somebody and uh, we see how they're dressed or we see what their job is or we see how they're living or we see what they look like, we say, well, that person thinks this, they believe that, they wouldn't be interested in anything that I have to say. I'm telling you, friends, that's wrong. Yes, it is. That's wrong. Because in spite of the rough exterior that Zacchaeus had and the fact that most of the Jews hated Zacchaeus, I want you to see in verse 3 what was going on on the inside of Zacchaeus. Would you look at it right there with me in verse number 3? The Bible says, And he, Zacchaeus, sought to see Jesus, who he was. You know, when we see people out there as Christians, we ought not to be asking ourselves what do they look like, and we ought not to be making excuses for them of why they wouldn't be interested. We ought to be saying, I wonder what's going on in their heart. Mm. Do you believe that the ministry of the Holy Spirit is to bring lost people to Jesus Christ? Yes. I do. We talked about that this morning in Sunday school. I believe that the Holy Spirit is working on everybody. <laughs> yeah. And there's people out there that are <laughs> curious to see who Jesus is. But you know what? They probably don't look like it. You know, the ministry of the Holy Spirit to a lost person is to convict them that they're a sinner and that they need a Savior. Sometimes that's pretty unpleasant to come to terms with, isn't it? Yes. It's a hard thing to be told that you're a sinner. Can I ask you a question? As a Christian, has the Holy Spirit ever convicted you about a sin in your life and you rebelled against the ministry of the Holy Spirit yes. as a Christian? Yes. If we can do that as a Christian, we ought to expect the world to do it that much more. We ought to, res we ought to anticipate when we see rebellion... On somebody's face, we ought to think that person's rebelling against God's work in their life. God's working on that person. It's a sign that God's drawing them to Himself. And they're just rebelling against it. They, they don't know what to do. They, they just don't know the truth. They don't know what steps they need to take. So we need to be careful by judging the book by their cover. This guy, he was hungry for the truth. It was the opposite of what you would think. You would think that Zacchaeus didn't want anything to do with anything that was Jewish. He wouldn't want to do anything with the Messiah. But the truth is, inside his heart, he was curious. You know, something else I see here in the passage, it says there in verse number um, 3, it says he sought to see Jesus who he was. He wanted to see Jesus. He wanted to find out more about Jesus. But then in the second half of that verse, it says he could not for the press because he was of little stature. You know, there are obstacles for sinners to come to Jesus. Now, in Zacchaeus' case, it was because he was short and there was a big crowd of people and he couldn't, he couldn't see Jesus, and he couldn't, he couldn't find his way through the crowd in order to get to Jesus, right? So <coughs> just, just think for a minute, as a Christian, what would be some of the obstacles for someone who was living a sinful lifestyle to come to a place like this for service, for church, to find out about Jesus? It'd be hard to come here. I'm just going to be honest with you. Yeah. It'd be hard. Um, I mean, look at Todd over there. I mean, man, look at, look at that suit, that suit coat, that tie. He's sharp, right? Woo! He's looking good. I mean, got velvet shoes. Are velvet shoes? I didn't, well, I, yeah, oh, oh, yeah. Over Jeff's got velvet shoes. Velvet red shoes. That's all those shoes. You can't miss those shoes, man. It looks good, right? But they see these people coming in here, and they're like, man, those people got their act together. Look at those. I don't have clothes like that. I can't, I can't go there. And I'm not against wearing nice clothes to church, Pastor Price. But you know what? It'd be an obstacle. It'd be a hurdle for somebody to just come here. 
right? Um, and they, they see people coming in here and they think those people really have it together. Those are good people that go there. I wouldn't fit in there. They'd have all kinds of obstacles to get over, among many more that we, we can mention. Uh, the peer pressure, I mean, their friends, if they found out that they went to church, I mean, oh my goodness, you know, what would they, what would they think of me? What would they say about me? So and so. There are all kinds of obstacles for, for, for sinners not to come to a place like this to find out who Jesus is. Can I tell you something? As a Christian, we need to do what Jesus did. We'll get there in just a little bit. But if they have obstacles to come to here, guess what we need to do? We need to go to there. That's right. We've got to go. That's what Matthew chapter 28 says. Our job is to go. You know, it's fascinating in this passage. Look down in verse number 6. This is talking about Zacchaeus again. It says, and he made haste and he came down and he received Jesus how? Joyfully. joyfully. You know there's no other way to receive Jesus. <laughs> if you receive Jesus, you receive him joyfully. Right? He received Jesus. Right? Uh, it's just fascinating. And uh, you know what? As, as, um, as Christians... You know, we want to be able to talk to people about their lost condition. We want to be able to see them receive Jesus. You guys, if you're Christians and you go back to school, there's a lot of people that you know that need Jesus. They need to be saved. And you can talk to them about that, and then they can receive Jesus joyfully. And that'd be just a wonderful thing. All right, so we've looked at Zacchaeus as the sinner. Now let's look at uh, Jesus as the soul winner. We could say more even about Zacchaeus. I mean, his life was changed as a result of his salvation this passage. Uh, in order for a life to be changed, it has to not be right in the first place. Does that make sense? So in other words, we can't be looking to lead people to Christ who already have everything right. We should be looking to lead sinners to Christ. And then when we lead sinners to Christ, their lives will be changed. All right? Luke chapter 19, let's consider Jesus as the soul winner. What, well, what it was that he does in this passage? All right, it says there in verse number 1, it says, And Jesus entered... And passed through Jericho. Now, if I was passing through Fort Lauderdale, maybe I would be on I-95, and maybe I'd be headed south, right? Maybe I'd be headed down to the Keys or something. If I was passing through Fort Lauderdale, I'd enter into uh, Fort Lauderdale from the north, and I would exit Fort Lauderdale from the south, and buddy, I'd just keep on going, right? You know, Jesus had some place to be here. He was headed to Jerusalem. In between him and Jerusalem was Jericho. And he had some place to be. He had a schedule. He was trying to get somewhere. But you know what? He met somebody in Jericho by the name of Zacchaeus. And you know what he was willing to do? He was willing to set aside his schedule for the day. He was willing to set aside his plans. You know, you and I are so schedule-oriented. We have so many things that we need to do in our days. We, I mean, we've got to go to work. We've got to get this accomplished at work. We've got to do this. We've got to run to the store on the way home. We've got to be home by a certain time so that we can have dinner, so that we can get the kids to Little League, so that we can do this and that we can do that and we can do this. And we've got to hit the tax-free shopping days and, and whatever it is. We have so many things that we put on our schedules and we're just so busy. And we just go here and we go here and we go here and we go here. Teenagers, you can be so busy, especially during school. I was talking this morning, you guys, you've not been very busy this summer, right? But, I mean, school starts, man, you need to be busy. You get involved in athletics or something like that, I'm telling you, you just... Everything's going to be busy. You're going to be scheduled. You're going to be scheduled. And everything's going to be decided for you, and you're just going to just pass through life. You know, we're so busy. We're so scheduled. You know what? In order to be a soul winner, you know what you need to be willing to do with your schedule? Just set it to the side. You know, it's not that important that you make it to wherever it is at 5.30. You know, if, if God impresses upon your heart, there's somebody that you need to talk to, just, you know, my schedule can be set aside. You know what? This is a higher priority. When there's a higher priority, then you take that. He was passing through a city. Passing through doesn't mean stopping to eat a meal and spend the night with somebody. But that's exactly what Jesus did. He was willing to set aside his schedule to reach the lost. Now, you could do that, couldn't you? Could you be willing to just set aside your busy schedule and to keep in mind that even as you have many things to do, and we all have many things to do, we can be willing to set that aside uh, to be able to talk to somebody about Jesus. Now, look in verse number 5 for the second thing that Jesus does here. First, he's just willing to set aside his schedule. And then verse number 5, it says, And when Jesus came to the place. What place? The place where Zacchaeus was. Okay? Now, very simply here. You need to go to the places where sinners are to engage them. That means that somewhere other than church. Okay? Now, Pastor Price, before you get all nervous and you think that I'm telling everybody that, they, that you need to go to the bars downtown and you need to go to all the party scenes and all those types of things, that is not, that is not, 
Be very clear that that is not what I'm saying. I am not suggesting or recommending that anybody compromise their testimony to go where the sinners are. Okay? But I do want to ask you a question, and I'm one of these preachers sometimes that I actually like feedback from the audience, so I want to ask a question. Where do sinners go? They go home. They go home. <laughs> That's right, they have homes, don't they? Where else do sinners go? Shopping. They go shopping. Do sinners go to Publix? Yes. Do you go to Publix? Yes. Do the sinners go to the doctor? Yes. Do you go to the doctor? Yes. I mean, sinners go everywhere that you go. So the, here's, here's what I'm saying. Everywhere that you already go, sinners are there. In school, you're already going to be going. Next week on Wednesday, you're going to school. Guess what? Sinners are going to be there. You don't have to compromise your testimony to go where sinners are. You already go where sinners are. You already go where sinners are. So we're doing pretty good so far. So far, you just have to be willing to set aside your busy schedule. And you have to go to the same places that you're already going if you want to be like Jesus. So, so far, so good, right? I haven't asked for anything really difficult. Be willing to set your schedule, set aside your schedule, and go where you're already going. All right, now what does he do after he goes to that place? Look at it in verse 5. And when Jesus came to the place, what does the Bible say? He what? Looked he looked up. All right? You know what we need to do if we want to be soul winners? Well, we need to look for sinners. That's pretty simple, isn't it? As we go to the places that we already go, well, we need to look for them. We need to look for them. You know, we're so busy... And also many times we're, we're, um, we're looking at something else, aren't we? Um, so many times, <clears throat> this, is, this is what we're doing. Right? And can I just tell you, I, I know that Jesus, whenever, whenever he looked up, he, he, he looked up into a tree, right? But you know what we need to do? But we need to look up. We need to look up. Oh, let's look. Look for people. Look for people. Pretty easy so far, isn't it? Be willing to set aside your schedule as you pass through and do your daily routines. Go where you already go and look for them. Now, the next one's going to happen automatically if you do the looking. Okay, Look at it in verse 5. The Bible says, And when Jesus came to the place and looked up, what's the Bible say? And saw. And saw. You know what's going to happen if you look for somebody to be a witness to? You're going to see people to witness to. You're going to see them. You're going to see them. They're everywhere. They're everywhere you go. All day, every day. If you look, you're going to see them. You guys, if you go to school, you guys, you go to school and you're just walking around like this and you're always on your phone, you're not going to see them. But you know what? If you look for people to witness to, you know what's going to happen? You're going to see people that you need to witness to. Anthony, you're going to see people that you need to tell about Jesus if you look for them. If you don't look for them, you're going to miss them. You've got to be looking for them. That's what Jesus did. Jesus was just willing to set aside his schedule. He went where people were, and he looked, and he saw. You know, you can find sinners anywhere. Jesus found one in a tree. If he found one in a tree, you can find one in public or wherever it may be. Right? Now, up to this point, it's been very easy. And here's where the rubber meets the road, because at this point, it finally gets hard. All right? But let's take a look at it and see what it says. Verse 5, And when Jesus came to the place... He looked up and saw him and what? And said, you guys are quiet on me this morning. Right? What happens? He said he had to open his mouth and he had to speak. You know, everything up to this point has been pretty simple. <clears throat> Anthony, you're going to go to school next week. You're going to look. You're going to see somebody. The Lord's going to say that you need to speak to that person. And then what? You're going to get nervous. But you know what you need to do? Cry out to God for help and go and talk to him anyway. Just talk to them. Open your mouth and preach to them Jesus. Now, I'm not saying preach like I'm preaching, right? But just preach to them. Tell them about Jesus. Tell them that God loves them. Tell them about Pastor Price and the things that they're doing, you're doing here at the church and how you have a good time here. Get them to come and all these different things. People, talk to your people that you, that you just run into, into the stores and the people that you work with and tell them about your church and invite them to come and tell them about Jesus. You had to open your mouth, and you just have to speak to them. You have to speak to them. So he looked, he saw, and then he spoke. You know, I know it's hard, and I, it's always going to be hard. But can I tell you something that, that kind of helps? If you'll just do it, it'll get easier. 
Now, it won't really ever just stop being difficult. But you know what? It gets easier. When I went to Bible college, if somebody had told me this, I probably wouldn't have gone to that Bible college. But um, I went to Ambassador Baptist College. And uh, after I got there and registered and moved my entire family from Florida, we used to live in Tampa. We moved from Florida up to North Carolina to go back to Bible college. Felt the Lord was calling us into the ministry. And uh, we got up there. I found out that as a requirement to be a student at the school, I had to go out into my community every week for two hours and knock on doors and tell people about Jesus. I about had a heart attack and died. I'm like, this is the worst idea ever, right? I was scared to death. I thought, you know, man, these people up here in the Carolinas, man, they're going to shoot me. You know, I don't want somebody coming up and knocking on their door. And, uh, but you know what? I had to. I was made to. And uh, so I went out, and for two hours a week, I started knocking on the doors, and I started talking to people about Jesus. Hardest thing I've ever done. But you know what? It got easier. It got easier. You know what it takes to just to be a good soul in it? Just start talking to people about Jesus. It'll get easier. You know what? Can, can, can I just be honest with you? You're, you're going to make mistakes. You're going to talk to somebody and then you're going to leave and you're going to think, oh, I should have said this or I should have said that. That's fine. Just learn from it. And then next time, do better. Right? But keep talking to people about Jesus. Just keep talking to them. I remember the first day I went out. We were walking down this road and then there was this big gravel driveway that went way up into the woods and I'm like, I am not walking down there. I'll never come out. You know? This is a terrible idea. The guy I was with just took off like it was just nothing, you know. I'm like keeping up with him, you know. I'm 34 years old and I'm keeping up with some 18-year-old, you know, going up there. It's just bold in his witness for the Lord and I'm trying to stay right on his tails, you know. We get up there and we knock on the door. This guy comes to the door. His name's Cliff. And uh, Cliff, he, he had uh, gone through a rough time in his life. I had just been divorced. Um, he went to church, but he knows he wasn't saved. And, uh, you know, he was really convicted that, that we were there and that we cared enough about him to come and knock on his door. And uh, he didn't get saved that day or anything. But uh, a couple of weeks later, it just seemed like the Lord impressed on my heart, go back and visit Cliff. So I, I went back over there and knocked on his door again. Right? He wasn't home. I left him a note. I'd go back over there. I think I went back over there five or six different times. I'd take different people with me, go over there, we'd talk to Cliff. One morning, Cliff walked through the doors of the church. The pastor preached a gospel message that morning. Cliff got saved. Cliff trusted Jesus Christ to be his Savior. That night, that night, and he had gone to church, but he never trusted Jesus Christ to be Savior. That night he got baptized. Amen. I asked him after the service, I said, hey, Cliff, I, let's, let's go to lunch, let's celebrate. You know what? He said, no, I can't go to lunch with you today. i got too many phone calls to make, too many people to invite to come to my baptismal service tonight. Huh. He was excited. He wanted to see who Jesus was. But somebody had to go find him. Man. Just go find him. Sorry. Look for him. Not every door will be a good one. Not every conversation is going to work. Some people get mad at you. That's fine. Just let them go and then go talk to somebody else. Look for somebody who's curious to see who Jesus is. Yes. There are Zacchaeuses out there who are curious to see who Jesus is. And we need to go find them. We need to take to them. There are people in your school who are curious to see who Jesus is. They have no idea. They have no idea. It's up to you guys to go share Jesus Christ in your school. You've got to be witnesses. You've got to go. And you've got to tell. You know, in, in verse number 10, and I'm done, the Bible says, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. You know, Jesus' mission was fishing. He was always fishing for souls, the souls of men. <clears throat> Can I tell you something about fishing? If you go fishing and you never put the bait in the water, I guarantee you, you will never catch anything. The fish aren't just going to jump in the boat. That would be kind of cool, right? They don't do that. you got to put the bait out there. You know what you need to do if you want to be a soul winner? Be willing to set aside your schedule. Go where you already go. Look, see, and speak. Put the bait out there. And you know what? You can catch the souls of men. You can lead people to Christ. Everybody can do that. Everybody in this room can. Every teenager can do that. You say, well, I don't know everything about the Bible. I don't either. That's fine. Tell them what you do know. They ask you a question you don't know, say, you know what, i got this guy you need to meet. His name's Pastor Price. He knows everything about the Bible. You know what, he doesn't know everything about the Bible either. Right? But you know what? 
be willing to talk to your friends if they have questions that you can't answer. But you know what? You just be faithful and you talk to the Lord about Jesus. Same thing for us adults. You know, just talk to people. They ask you some question you don't know, say, I don't know, why don't you come to church with me? We'll ask that one to my pastor. That's a good question. I just tell them, that's a great question. I was uh, talking to a lady here recently. I, I wish I had all the answers for people, but sometimes you just don't, you don't have all the answers for it. This lady was just, uh, she's just really got, she's, she's, if she's got one question, she's got a thousand questions. You ever met anybody like that? Yeah, Tony. Tony. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know what? I just, I am, and just, I am just loving this lady because she's asking questions. And I'm just thrilled to be able to try to answer some of the questions that she has. And you know what? She's going to ask me some questions that I don't know. And I'm going to have to do some study and try to figure out the best way to answer her questions. But I'm just thrilled that she's asking questions. If somebody asks you a question, be excited that they're asking you a question. That means they're curious. That means they have questions. And, it, and, and you can work then to get them the answer. Don't be afraid uh, of these things. Just, just, just talk to people and just love them. And I think that you can do that. You know, if we'll just do what Jesus did, we can have the same results that Jesus had. We can see people get saved. We can see people's lives changed. And then those barriers that are there to keep them from coming to a place like this, all of a sudden they're not there anymore. And then they can come. And God moves in. And the ministry of the Holy Spirit is then working in their life and can begin to produce that change that is so needed. Let's be a part of that. Let's be soul leaders. Teenagers, if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, be a soul winner. Tell other people about Jesus. Say, you know what, I'm not even sure I know Jesus. We need to get saved. We need to trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. The Bible says it's very simply like this. I'm just going to do a little illustration to illustrate it. Uh, let's let this hand represent you and I. Every, everybody look up here. Every, every eye up here. Let's let this hand represent you and I. And uh, we'll use my cell phone. Uh, we'll let this represent sin. The Bible says that all men have sinned. So this is sin. So here we are, here's our sin. The Bible says we all have sin on us. And the Bible says, let's let, let's let the sin represent God. Our sin separates us from God. Our sin separates us from God. The Bible says that the only way to pay for our own sin is to die and spend an eternity in hell. But the Bible also says that God loves us. And he sent his only begotten son, Jesus Christ. So let's this hand represent Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ came as the Son of God, lived a perfect and sinless life. And the Bible says when he died on the cross that God the Father took our sins off of us and he placed them onto Jesus Christ. And as Jesus Christ hung there on that cross, God the Father punished Jesus for the sins that you and I had done. Jesus was without sin, but he became sin for us. And then Jesus died, was buried, and then three days later he rose victorious over sin, over grave, and over hell. And the Bible says if we will just believe that he did that for us, We'll be forgiven of our sins. We'll be given holy name. You know, if you've never done that before, you can do that today. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Father, I thank you so much, Lord, for the opportunity just to preach your word here in Fort Lauderdale. Father, I pray that you would help us, Lord, to be soul winners. Lord, help us to realize that there's so many obstacles, Lord, that keep sinners from coming to a place like this. Help us to realize that we need to go to where they are. We need to be obedient. We need to be willing to set aside our schedules. We need to look. We need to see. We need to speak. Lord, we need to show them Jesus. Lord, help us to do that. Father, I pray for one that's here this morning who needs Jesus. They're curious about who Jesus is, and they need to be saved this morning. Father, I pray that you'd help them trust Christ as their Savior. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're here this morning and you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior and you'd like to do that, you do that very simply by just agreeing with Jesus that you are a sinner. You agree with Jesus that you deserve to go to hell. And you look to Jesus and Jesus alone to save you from your sins. Because he died on the cross for you. If you'd like to do that this morning, uh, you just talk to God in your own words and you just tell him those things. Uh, you can pray to God and you can say something like this. You can say, dear God in heaven, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that I deserve to go to hell because of my sin." But I know that you sent your son, and your son died on the cross. He paid for my sin. And today, I trust him to be my Savior, to forgive me of my sin, and to give me all of him. Now, if you're here today, and nobody's looking around, every head's bowed and every eye's closed. If you're here today, and you prayed that prayer, and you asked Jesus to save you, would you just raise your hand right where you said, just so I can rejoice and be just be glad with you. Yeah, I see that hand. Praise the Lord. 
praise the Lord. Anybody else? I said that prayer. I trusted Jesus Christ to be my Savior today. Anybody? Praise the Lord. Lord, we thank you for this one who's trusted Jesus as their Savior. Father, I pray that you'd be with every person in this room, that you'd help us to be soul winners. Lord, that we would be able to see people saved. Uh, Lord, because of the things that we do, that we pattern our life after the life of Jesus Christ. Thank you for the time we've had to spend here this morning. That's that you'd be with the day and the travels and everything that's going on this afternoon. And in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Pastor. Amen. In just a moment, we will conclude our service. Before we do that, I would like to have just a minute and uh, allow every person the opportunity to just make a decision on the basis of uh, what Brother Duke has preached. Now, he preached the gospel preach the need for individuals who are lost without Jesus to receive Jesus as their Savior. He also spoke primarily about the motivation of the gospel. You know, when you recognize what sin is and the consequences that it has, you realize how much trouble the world's in. I was in trouble before I met Jesus. And you know, sometimes the need is greater than the feeling that you have about discomfort or whatever it is that would make you uh, not want to share the gospel or not be motivated to share the gospel of Jesus. My friend, when you realize that people that you love are lost and dead in their trespasses and sins, and that God is not only right to judge, but He must judge sin, you realize people are in trouble. People that I love. And I've got to tell them about Jesus. When you realize that people that don't love you are lost and dead in the trespasses and sins, and you realize the consequence, the eternal consequence of sin, you realize, even if they don't love me, I have to tell them about Jesus. I don't know what kind of a person you'd be to walk by a house on fire and not wake the people in the house just because it was their problem. I realize that actually we live in a very desensitized society where if there's not an, a personal incentive or something for me to gain, that that's their problem. We really think that way a lot of times, don't we? They don't want to hear it. That's their problem. You know something? It's time that we get over ourselves and realize care if it's their problem. It's my problem to tell them their problem. And not everyone wants to hear they've got a problem, but the world is lost. They're dead in their trespasses and sins. And it's our business. It's our business to be about telling people about Jesus Christ. And I want to say one last thing about that before we finish up our invitation today. Some years ago, I realized that nobody's really a good candidate for salvation. That's right. First of all, every person who comes to Jesus is wicked. They're lost, they're dead in their trespasses and sins. Secondly, what Brother Duke mentioned today is that they're under conviction. You ever have to talk to somebody about something they're in trouble for? Is it a popular topic? If the Holy Spirit of God is working on someone, He has showed them that they are lost and that God's going to judge them. And they're frustrated and angry and they're resisting God. Do you think that they're going to want you to bring it up? You ever had to talk to somebody about something that needed to be talked about? Whether they wanted it brought up or not? Now, I have had the privilege before of saying, you know, I'd like to talk to you about, about your soul. And I've had people say, I was hoping you'd mention that. It's happened a few times. Mostly, that isn't the way it goes. But they need to talk about it. We need to share that. We need to share the truth with them. And so God's probably spoken to us a lot about that today. I wouldn't want my worst enemy to go to hell. I don't really have any worst enemies, but I wouldn't want the most despicable person in the world to go to hell. I sure wouldn't want somebody that I knew, or that was my neighbor, or that I saw in the grocery store, or that I saw at a school. I wouldn't want anyone to go there. But friend, God... God gives us conviction, doesn't He, about that, the Holy Spirit. If God spoke to you today about that, and He's just 
specifically put his finger on something in your life and said, you know, this is an area where it's time for you to take a step of spiritual growth or to commit to me. Why don't you respond in the invitation? We're not going to ask anyone to come forward this morning. We just ask that as uh, everyone stands, we're going to open up to page 251 in our hymn books. We're going to sing Almost Persuaded. It's really a song for the lost. And as we sing it, if God's persuaded you about something and you're almost persuaded but you haven't said, yes, Lord, would you do that while we sing? We're going to sing just all three uh, all three verses of the invitations, the invitational hymn, and then uh, that's going to be it. You just respond to God. You could just bow your head if you uh, feel it's appropriate to do so. You could uh, just remain seated or sit down and just do business with God while we sing and take advantage of this opportunity. It's a tragedy when God speaks to us and we don't say yes to Him or respond to Him. So that's the time what the invitation is for in our service. Almost persuaded now to believe. Almost persuaded now to believe. Almost persuaded Christ to receive. Seems now some soul to say, Go Spirit, go thy way. Some more convenient day on the afar. Almost persuaded, come, come today. Almost persuaded, turn not away. Jesus invites you here.